The first mission station in Uganda was built in Nchwanga, about 160 kilometers outside of the capital city of Kampala. The ground where I am speaking from is called Nchwanga. This place is very historical in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Uganda because our pioneers in the year 1927, in December, they came and camped here. This is where the very first Seventh-day Adventist mission station was established in the country. And from here, our church has grown and has spread to all parts of the country, having been launched from this very ground. After 20 years of working in this territory, missionaries learned that the work was progressing faster near the city of Kampala. So they moved their headquarters from this fertile one square mile of land to a spot near Kampala. Today, the landscape of Uganda might look a little different than it did back then, but there are still great mission opportunities. About 80% of the population is under the age of 35, and the median age for the whole country is 16. There is a vibrancy and energy in the population, but there is also the challenge of unemployment. As leaders of this caring church, they see this challenge as a chance to nurture and equip them by implementing Christ's method. A center of influence is being started in Nchwanga, where Adventist work began in the country. We want to establish a discipleship and a livelihood training center. When we bring these young people, we will disciple them, ground them in our values, ground them in the Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle. But above all, we also want to integrate livelihood skills so that in addition to being equipped to sharing their faith and participating in the life and mission of the church, they are also equipped to be self-supporting so that they can go all over the country and witness for Christ, but also share in the skills they will acquire from this very ground in, in, in Inchuanga. At this training center, students will receive hands-on agricultural experience. They will learn how to work with the ground, nurture crops, watch them grow, and enjoy the harvest. The farm is big enough to train and equip many students. This farm is seated on 640 acres of land. That is one square mile. So. Um, we have uh, projects of uh, banana plantation, pineapple plantation, cocoa plantation, and uh, fish ponds, and also passion fruit plantation. This farm is uh, here as the initiative of Western Uganda Field to provide uh, food to the community. This is uh, a food basket to the surrounding communities so the aim of this uh, farm, it is to provide the quality food and solve uh, the hunger problem to the surrounding communities. Currently, the church rents a big portion of the land to community members, which helps their livelihood. There are 13 workers to maintain the farm. The plan to use this farm as a training center is well accepted by the local church and the management of this farm, as well as the community. But when the church manages to establish um, a research center or a, an institution which can train people in skills and also um, give hands-on knowledge, I think it will be an ideal and also an answer to the church first and also to the community at large. So whenever we bring the youth of the church can be trained and get the skills to go and advance the mission with the self-support skills that they will have gained from this place. Your 13th Sabbath offering will help build this training center. The church is excited to train and equip more youth who can go out to preach the gospel and support themselves to disciple others. Please pray for this project, especially the students that are coming to this training center. Thank you for supporting the Satini Sabbath mission offering in this place.
So did you recognize the name of that song? All right. Joshua has a scripture reading for us this morning. In this matter, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joshua. We call it the Lord's Prayer, right? And you know it, probably the most common way that we know it. Most people have memorized that from the King James Version, right? Have you ever prayed the Lord's Prayer as a whole group together? I'm going to have a short prayer, and I will just make a comment in the prayer that says, and thank you for teaching us to pray, and then I want all of us to join together in that prayer, in the King James Version. Will you do that with me? Good morning again, Father. Thank you for the beauty of another day of life. Thank you that it's Sabbath and that we can come together and praise you in song and music and prayer. Speak to our hearts today and thank you for teaching us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. I was uh, doing some reading about the Lord's Prayer, and, and one uh, commentator said, that's not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is found in John 17. We'll look at it a little bit later. This is him teaching us how to pray. And... That's probably correct and true. Um, it's an outline prayer that Jesus included in the Sermon on the Mount, which we just shared together. Luke tells us about the first time that he shared that prayer with his disciples. Luke 11, chapter 1. Now when it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples to pray. Teach us to pray. Now wait a minute. These were spiritually minded men, weren't they? Didn't they know how to pray? Well, yes, they knew how to pray, but there was something unique, refreshing, empowering about the way Jesus prayed. Jesus, teach us to pray like you pray. Do you know how to pray? Sure. It's just something we know how to do, right? Do we need to be taught to pray? Yeah. Every one of us who prays was taught to pray. Learning to pray, for me, was first by my mom and dad when I was a little kid. I don't remember a time that I never knew how to pray, but I will tell you my prayer life has grown and changed and matured as I've gotten older. How about yours? Prayer is so simple a child can pray, but it's so huge and big and powerful that we can continue to learn about prayer and connection with God and what it's all about. Prayer should be words from our hearts that reflect our growing maturity, right? This morning I want to share with you some things about prayer that, that we need to know. The sermon of today's, the title of today's sermon is Seven Elements of Successful Prayer. And we're going to look at what the Bible teaches, but first, what is the purpose of prayer? Why do we pray? I'm hearing a number of good answers. A few years ago, I, I watched a group of high school students doing a skit, a play about prayer, and the person was frustrated um, because they were praying and they weren't getting what they were asking for. 
And uh, the skit was inspired to get us to ask the question, is that what prayer is for? To go to God and get what we're asking for? Is that what prayer is about? No? Yes? Well, actually, both answers could be correct, depending upon how we look at it. What we really want, God knows. And we may think we know what we want, but the reality is, once we get it, it's not what we wanted. And this isn't in my notes, but it just came to my mind. Do you know how many people have won big dollars in the lottery? Because that's what's going to solve all their problems. And it didn't solve any of their problems. It didn't solve any of their problems. Someone just last weekend was talking, oh, I need to win the lottery, it would solve all my problems. And I thought, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. It actually probably brings more problems. Uh, prayer is our connection with God. God who knows what it is we really need and ultimately what it is within us that we really, really want. Prayer is our connection to God, connection to our Creator who loves us, our Redeemer who sacrificed Himself for us, our Recreator who is restoring us and rebuilding us and making us in His image once more. Have you ever heard it said that prayer is the breath of the soul? Prayer is the breath of the soul. How long can you hold your breath? Not real long, right? <laughs> Not real long. Uh, if you hold your breath for too long, you're going to pass out. I've never done that. But I was thinking and going through my sermon this morning as I was sitting at the breakfast table, and I thought, hmm, how long can I hold my breath? So I set the timer. How many think I made one minute? How many think I made at least one minute? I made at least one minute. How many think I made it to two? How many think I made it to two and a half? Oh, you got a lot of faith. <laughs> I made it to one minute and 45 seconds, and I thought, I need a breath. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to pass two minutes. When I got to two minutes. I'm going to keep, I said, pass two minutes. I didn't pass out, but at two minutes and 10 seconds, I took a breath. And <sighs> Now, don't time yourself right now during the sermon. We don't want anyone passing out. <laughs> so, but two minutes and ten seconds. I beat that in the times past. But uh, this morning, that's what I made. And so, uh, I felt okay with that. But you know what I feel more okay about? That I'm breathing. <laughs> and I don't have to think about it that much. It just happens. Like breathing, our spiritual connection with God needs to be, it must be constant in, or, in order to sustain spiritual life. If we cease praying, our spiritual life begins to die. And there's two parts to breathing, right? What are the two parts to breathing? In and out. You got to do them both. In and out. Well, if prayer is like breathing... Using that metaphor, what's the in and out? Speaking and listening. Prayer needs to be in and out. Out to God, sharing what we want, in what he has to say to us, and speaking to us. Talking and listening. How does God talk to us? Through his word, I asked a couple of weeks ago, have any of you ever been praying for something and the answer came to you in words directly from the word of God? It was a Bible verse and it gave you the answer and you knew God was speaking to you through bringing that verse. And I saw a lot of nods then and I see more now. Absolutely. Sometimes it may simply be impressions upon the heart. Impressions upon the heart. One day I was... Uh, as I was sitting and studying in college, uh, it was quite an eventful day, experience. Then the impression was what you're reading right now in your Bible, which was part of my uh, um, Bible study assignment for a class, 
go tell Bill about it. Hmm. I guess I should tell Bill about this. And so I kept, and the impression, go tell Bill about this. Hmm. Yeah, I should tell Bill about this. Bill might like, Bill was a new Christian. And as a new Christian, had been baptized, joined the church. His pastor began talking and said, Bill, you're college age. Have you ever thought about going to college? Well, I thought about it. Hey, I've got a college you need to go to. Keene, Texas. Southwestern Adventist University. It wasn't Southwestern Adventist University at that time, but the same school. Uh, and so Bill came, and I hadn't met Bill. And I love being around new Christians. You know what I love about new Christians? They're alive and excited. They're alive and excited. And if you want to stay alive and excited, hang around with new Christians. If you want to, okay, if you're an old Christian, that doesn't mean you can't be alive and excited. <laughs> but uh, some of the excitement, people begin to mellow out. And I'm one of those that likes to keep being excited. So I'm reading, go to show this to Bill. And I thought, well, this is, God, are you telling me to go to talk, show this to Bill right now? Okay, I'm going. And I got up and I went and I knocked on the door. And Bill said, come in. And as I walked into the room, then in their dorm room, then they had a bed on each side of the room with the headboard against the outside wall. I walked in. Bill is laying on his bed with his hands behind his head, uh, just laying there, legs crossed. Hey, Bob, come on in. Have a seat. Beside his uh, bed was, uh, was his desk. And I pulled the chair out, and I sat down, and I had my Bible with me. He said, what's up, Bob? I said, Bill, I was just impressed to come down here and share this Bible verse with you. And so I started reading it, and Bill sat up, and I hadn't noticed before, but his Bible was open and laying on his desk. He sat up, and he picked up his Bible, and he didn't turn a page, but he just put his finger down <laughs> and started reading. And I stopped, and I said, Bill had a big grin. I said, what's going on, Bill? Something's going on here. Bob, I was reading my Bible, trying to understand, and I came to the verse you're reading, and I didn't understand at all what it was saying. And so I prayed, God, if you want me to understand this, you're going to have to send someone here to explain it to me. And you walked in the door. Wow. Now you know why I remember that story. Impressions upon the heart. That was one of the first times that it had so powerfully been obvious that God had impressed upon my heart what I was supposed to be doing. Yes, God's impressed upon our hearts and we do it, but how often is it confirmed? That was an absolute answer to prayer of what I just prayed for. And so God, three doors down and across the hall, picked somebody to get up and go down there and explain it to him. It was exciting. Impressions upon the heart. But I must emphasize something. When in prayer, and God is, I wasn't even in prayer. I was perhaps in an attitude of prayer because I was reading my Bible. But when God impresses upon our hearts, he will never impress upon our hearts anything that in any way contradicts anything that he's already said and been recorded in the Bible. The impressions upon our heart will always be in 100% harmony with what the Word of God has to say. God doesn't say two different things. He speaks the truth always. Um, so, this morning I want to share with you some of the elements and the components of successful prayer. But first, I want to ask you, when you have you ever plan to go and talk with someone about something and made notes about what you wanted to say so that you wouldn't forget? Several people nodding yes. I do that when I go to see the doctor. I make notes because I want to make sure I talk about this. Okay. Uh, who are some other instances or what are some other instances where you might make a note because you're going to go talk with someone and you want to make sure that Everything is talked about that you want to talk about. What? A job interview. A job interview. Yes. What else? 
A business meeting, absolutely. A lawyer. Uh, you want to make sure everything is talked about? The list could go on and on. Um, might be my mom. Uh, I want to make sure that I talk with my mom about this. I make myself a note uh, that I talk about it. Uh, this afternoon, it already was mentioned, Pathfinders. Those that are interested in helping get our Pathfinder Club up and going, we have some fantastic kids in this church, and we want to have and enjoy Pathfinder Club together. I've made some notes. We could call those notes an agenda, right? we got a board meeting Monday night, board members. I'll be sending you out the agenda. If you've got anything that you want on it, let me know so it can get on there. So we plan ahead. And so what I would like to suggest is these elements of prayer that we're about to look at may be looked at as an agenda. Some things to make sure that we address each one of these different things. Jesus taught the first element or component of prayer in the opening words of the example prayer that he shared with his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What does hallowed mean? It's not a common word. Holy. I looked it up and I thought, yeah, it's got to mean holy. Hallowed means holy, highly respected, to hold in honor, to praise. So this first element of successful prayer, we call praise. When you talk to God, do you praise Him? Yeah. Uh, in Psalms 50, verse 23, God says, whoever, who, whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. God must be respected. Not for his sake, but for our sake. God must be respected. Proverbs 9 verse 10 tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And fear in this verse is the old English use of the word. It means reverent respect. Recognizing the greatness and power and the wisdom of God. Though God is our friend, and he calls us friend, we must recognize that in our relationship with him, we're never going to be equals. In fact, I don't aspire to be his equal. <laughs> I, aspire to be, I aspire to be like him, but not his equal. When in vision Isaiah saw God, he said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of Lords. The first component and element of prayer is praise. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And Jesus continued, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How would you sum up this element of this sentence? Your kingdom come, your will be done. How about submission? Submission. Is it okay to tell God what you want? Yeah. Jesus did it in the Garden of Gethsemane, didn't he? Matthew 26 tells us of one of Jesus' prayers and says, He went a little further. It fell on his face. He fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But he didn't stop there. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Do we realize that God knows what is best in every situation? Does everything happen just the way God wants it to? Actually, no. God knows what is best, but everything doesn't happen just the way he wants it to. Why not? Because he gave me the freedom of choice. And he's not going to take it away even when I make a bad choice, which is not what he wants me to do. Are you glad you have the freedom of choice? Are you proud of the bad choices you made? No. <laughs> no. In fact, that's what repentance and confession and prayer is all about. 
okay, I messed up, God. Your will be done. If in prayer I can learn to trust God, sharing my thoughts and my wants, but listening to Him and submitting my will to His wisdom, I know that I will receive what is best for me. And that's what I really want anyway. I want what's best for me. Submission is the secret. In verse 11, we see a request. Give us this day our daily bread. A petition for our needs. In Philippians 4, 6, we're told, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. Praying for our daily bread is a humble prayer. Do we, in today's circumstances and land of plenty, do we need to pray for our daily bread? My daily bread is in my refrigerator or in my freezer for the next month. And my wife told me just the other day, quit buying food, Bob. We need to use up what we've got. And so I listened for the most part to what she had to say this week when I bought a package of cookies. <laughs> Praying for our daily bread. We need to pray that God will teach us what we really need and submit ourselves to him. Sometimes without thinking about it, our prayers can be selfish. Can't they? Is a selfish prayer okay? At least you're praying. At least you're praying. Perhaps it would be good for us if when we pray for something, we tell God why we want it. And maybe telling him why we want it, we may stop and think, okay, God, forget that. I don't need it after all. If we have to justify what we're praying for and we realize it's just for me because that's what I want, okay, God, give me what I need. I'll, I'll slow down, be a little bit more humble. In his model prayer, Jesus taught us to call on God to provide for our needs, what we truly need. But a few verses later, he also said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Let's get our priorities right. Let's seek God, his kingdom, his righteousness. In his model prayer, we're also told to pray and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So another element of successful prayer is confession and, and repentance. Forgive us our debts as we forgive, as we forgive our debtors. First John 1 John 1.9, you probably know this one from memory. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession is a condition for forgiveness. It's interesting sometimes how we might play word games. Sometimes we say, forgive my sins. Sometimes it's said, and I've heard it, forgive my sins and my mistakes. Mistakes isn't quite as bad as sins, right? Forgive my sins and, and my mistakes. Um, I've even heard this. Father, if I have sinned, please forgive me. If I have sinned. For our own good, we need to be specific with, with God. If we simply say, forgive us our sins, that's where we probably need to breathe in and hear what God says because he's got a question. Which ones? What are you talking about here? <laughs> It's good for us. We need to be specific and open our hearts to God and acknowledge who we are and what we've done, even what we've thought. It gets personal. It can even be emotional. Have you ever just sobbed and wept in confession to God? Yeah. This is something that needs to be done in private prayer, or in a group of those who you've confided with, the specifics of confession. I'm not in favor of you coming up and confessing all your secret sins before the church, and 
asking them to pray with you for your secret sins. Um, it might cause more harm than good. I was actually, oh, it's been a dozen years ago or more. Yeah, come to think of it, 18 years ago, I was in some pastor's meetings. And the fellow who was there was teaching how important it is that we had to stand in front of the church and confess every detail of our sins. And this was a pastor that had been invited in to be talking about church growth and all of that. And I walked out of the meeting. And I went out and had some one-on-one -on -one time with me and God. And then I went to the conference president and I said, I can't agree with what that guy's saying. He said... You're not the only one who's come to me, Bob. <laughs> there is a wisdom in not airing all your dirty laundry, right? But when it comes to God, He already knows. And we need to talk with Him about it so that every part of our garments can be clean and made spotless and made holy. And we must be willing to forgive. This may be something that we need to ask God help with. I've had to. I don't want to forgive somebody. They're not even repentant. In prayer, we need to seek His forgiveness. We need His help in giving us a heart of forgiveness such as He has. Is there any sin which God will not forgive? The unpardonable sin? Have you committed the unpardonable sin? No. You haven't. You know how I know? Because you're here today. And I have visited with many people, many, a number of people over the years, and that have said, I'm just concerned that I have committed the unpardonable sin. I said, really? And so, tell me about your fear. I'm afraid that I've lost the kingdom of heaven because of my sin. Do you want to be in the kingdom of heaven? Oh, yes, I want to be in the kingdom of heaven. Do you want to submit your life to God? Oh, if only... Yes, I want to submit my heart to God. And I says, good news, you haven't committed the unpardonable sin. How do you know? Because if you've committed the unpardonable sin, the Holy Spirit is left. And you can't want the kingdom of heaven and Jesus in your heart if the Holy Spirit isn't here. The unpardonable sin is the sin of not wanting God. The only sin God can't forgive is the sin of saying, no, thank you, God. But sin is a serious thing that needs to be changed. I don't want to be a sinner. You don't want to be a sinner. We want to be right and pure and holy. In prayer, we need to seek His forgiveness as well as making things right with others. Confession and repentance are elements of successful prayer. In verse 13, it's a, it's a request, it's a petition, but it is specific. And lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is a prayer for deliverance. We need to pray for deliverance. Without God's protect, protection, we're lost. We can't face the enemy on our own. And don't even think it. Lead us not into, into temptation. An interesting phrase. But I have to ask you this morning... Do you really, really, really want deliverance from temptation? Sometimes we're entertained by sin, aren't we? Yeah. Magazines, books, TV, movies, video games. It's fun. That's the sinful heart. Being entertained by sin. Lord, lead us not in temptation. Free me from this. And this is something we probably need to truly pray about and expand upon in this part of the agenda. Lead us not into temptation. I'm having a trouble because I kind of like being tempted. But I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to enjoy being tempted to do it. 
How foolish. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about myself. How foolish. We can learn from King David, whose prayer is recorded in Psalms 51 and a number of others as well. He prayed, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. And in the next few verses, he gets specific of sins that he is asking God to cleanse him from. And in verse 10, he prays, and you know this verse, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. This is a prayer that we all need to continually pray. In his model prayer, Jesus concluded, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This element of successful prayer can be called perspective and commitment. For yours is the kingdom. Whose kingdom is it? God's. God's kingdom. Your kingdom come. If we want to be a part of His kingdom, we must submit to His authority. He must be first, not me. We need to pray with perspective. We need to pray for perspective, committed to His kingdom. We may be given positions of responsibility in His kingdom on earth, but it's his kingdom, not ours. Proverbs 3, 6 tells us, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Acknowledge him, his kingdom, you're in charge. As I was on my way to the door of Costco this week with a bag of cookies in my hand, <laughs> then the young girl, teenage girl in front of me, I noticed her shirt on the back of it. It said... Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I took a couple of steps closer so I could step up beside her and I said, You must be a Christian. You should have seen her face light up. She said, You like my shirt? I said, I sure do. And I still remember that smile on her face. Teenage girl, witnessing for Jesus with the shirt she was wearing. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's one more important element of prayer that Jesus clearly modeled in another prayer. Not part of the Lord's Prayer, but John 17 that I had mentioned to you before. Talking with his father about his disciples, he said in verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. That's my focus right now. My disciples, my followers. Then in verse 11, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one, as we're one. In verse 15, he says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. <clears throat> Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and me, right? We believe it. Jesus was praying for you. Absolutely. He was praying for you. For those also who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me. And then in verse 24, he prays, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Jesus wants us with him. And he prayed for us to be there with him. This element of prayer we can call intercession. Intercessory prayer can be praying for those who are not praying for themselves. Intercessory can be praying for those who are sorry for their sins or those who aren't. Intercessory prayer can be can keep the Holy Spirit working in answer to our prayers 
when the person is doing everything they can to reject the Holy Spirit being there. But when we pray for someone, the Holy Spirit says, yeah, I'll answer your prayer. I'll knock on their heart's door again. I'll be there with them. I'll be there with them. And how many people are going to be in the kingdom of heaven because somebody else prayed for them when they had no interest in God at all? Intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer for the safety of our children, our families, our parents. Intercessory prayer for your friend in the hospital in intensive care. Intercessory prayer for, for your mother, your father. Uh, and, and his heart and his health and time. Incessory prayer for anyone that God puts on our hearts to pray for. Because God will do that as well. You know, if you would only pray for so-and-so, that would give me the ability to do what I want to do. And we pray and God says, all right, I'm on it. And God is there. Follow the example of Jesus. Pray for one another. Prayer is the breath of the soul that keeps us alive spiritually. So let's review now on the screen the seven elements of successful prayer. Praise, submission, petition for our needs, confession and repentance, deliverance, perspective and commitment, intercession. We're going to leave that up for just a little bit. You can jot it down or you can take your phones out like some of you are doing right now. I was going to suggest that already. Take a picture of that and have some pleasure in using it as an agenda as you pray to God. And say, okay, God, you put this on today's agenda. I'm going to praise you today. And I was doing that this week, praising God. And, you know, something that just moves my heart. Thank you, God, for being the creator you are. Your creation is beyond comprehension. In fact, Perry, you were telling me last night about this new telescope, the, what's the name of it? The James Webb Telescope. And that it is really shaking up the evolutionary world, the world of evolutionists. Because as they peer better and deeper into space, they're not discovering a universe that is in development. They're discovering a universe that, no matter how far they see, is there. It's been created. God spoke and it was done. And I shared this with you a while back. I was reading in a National Geographic magazine about the Big Bang Theory. And they figured out where the Big Bang occurred. And I was excited when I read about it. Where the Big Bang occurred... They know where God was standing when he said, bang! <laughs> and the world is, and the worlds, the creations, the universes, the solar systems, they were created. But you know, as I thought about praising God, I cannot imagine a greater and more wonderful God than the God that we learn about in scriptures, a God of love, a God of self-sacrifice, a God that is so interested in every created being that he cares for them to have the greatest and most joyous existence for all eternity. Just think, if there was a God with a different perspective, no, I don't want to. I like that perspective of God, and as I think to praise God, that was some of the things that came to my mind. You see, as I was praying the agenda, God was impressing upon me who he is as I'm sharing with him what I'm so thankful for. And you can do that one by one, submission, petition for our needs, all the way down to intercession for others. But most important, whether you're following an agenda or not, pray. Pray and share with God what's on your heart. Open to God. Be in conversation. 
Have you had a prayer recently answered? Well, have you prayed a prayer recently for an answer? God's not going to answer a prayer that we don't pray for. We can't have answered prayers if we're not asking. God wants us to ask. And then look and watch and see the answers. Oh, Lord Jesus, use me today in your service. And it's wide open. I don't care where and how. And that was an honest prayer right there. May we pray to God continually. Is your time with God what it should be? For me, the answer is no. God, help me for it to be more than what it is today. I need to be more deliberate in my prayer. I need to be more intentional in, in my prayer. I need prayer to be the breath of life. Are you breathing? Will you make a pact with me this morning? A promise to let's breathe in prayer. Let's be intentional. Let's make it a habit. So much so that praying is as natural as breathing continuously in prayer to God. May we pray the large prayer of submission, a prayer of allowing you to be the one that is restoring us in your wisdom. And we do pray that our experience with you in prayer continue to grow today, tomorrow, and for all eternity. Thank you for the fact that we can call upon you, that you hear, that you will answer, and we look forward to how you answer these prayers. In Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen.